Okay, now it's like 10, 10. So I guess we'll just start. So good evening, everyone. And good afternoon and good morning for some of you. So welcome to Kai Talks. I am Nora. And also with me is Ali. We will be the moderator for today's session. Uh, firstly, we would like to thank you for your enthusiastic participation in the first talk. Now we are really excited to have our second Kai Talks. Hopefully, like this initiative will continue in the far future and become a valuable resource for Kaistians. So in the last talk, we discussed uh, about how to start your career in the field of software engineering. And for today, we are going to discuss how to get into top grad schools. With us, there are three great speakers, Ms. Clara, Mr. Yosef, and Mr. Parman, who are KAIS alumni. So I would like to explain about how the event will proceed. So the event will proceed with a presentation given by each speaker for around 10 to 15 minutes, and also followed by a Q&A session at the end. We have received uh, and also gathered some questions from some of you. However, if you have any other things to ask, you can always ask the speakers through the chat box, or you can also raise your hand and ask the questions directly to the speakers. Without further ado, okay, let's begin the session. So Ms. Clara Chiutara will be our first presenter today. A brief introduction about our first speaker. Uh, Ms. Clara graduated from KAIS in 2017. She majored in chemical and biomolecular engineering and minored in BTM, business and technology management. She's now a PhD candidate in material science, University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Additionally, she's an incoming summer intern at Fraunhofer Institute of Casting, Composite and Processing Technology in Germany. So dear Ms. Clara, you may start the presentation now. Okay. Um... Uh, yes, I'll share my screen. Um, uh, everyone can see my screen well? Yes. Okay. Well, I guess this slide is basically uh, the stuff you've already seen in the poster and what Nora just basically brushed over just now. I'm a PhD candidate in material science. I did my undergrad here in chemical engineering. Um, and I'll be doing a summer internship, uh, I hope next month, and Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. So, well, my background is, as I've mentioned, uh, chemical engineering, and I did some minor in business just because um kind of wanted to branch out out of the traditional chemical engineering field at that time so i decided to try some business courses and it was actually really fun and uh, i had some experience before going to grad school i did a couple of research in different labs in kai's um not necessarily all in cbe uh, I did one research in a material science lab too. Um, I did a couple of conferences. Um, so I'm the one that mostly was very important was the one where I got to go present my research in the Aspire League, which was a, I think, com at five universities in five universities in uh, Asia that are top in technology and everything and they gathered the undergraduate to present their research and that was a very um, remarkable experience for me and I think that also got me some insight of whether or not I want to, to go to grad school. Um, uh, I did some extracurricular activities. I, I was active in um, BizWorld, um, which was the startup organization in KAIS. I'm not sure if it's still going on at this point of the pandemic, but uh, it was a very um, interesting uh, experience for me where I got to organize some stuff, con communicated with a lot of people from different backgrounds and hosted an event that had over 100 participants. So it was cool. I did an exchange program and 
Georgia Tech, and that also gave me a kind of some kind of insight that uh, I think I wanted to go to grad school. I think I wanted to go to the United States for this too, and that kind of was something that was important in my decision of whether or not I wanted to go to grad school and where. And I did a summer school um, in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. That was also a fun experience where I got to meet a lot of people and that that kind of like opened my eyes to a lot of other possibilities of what people could do after they graduate. And yeah, um, I guess that's enough about me. I. I think we're talking about how to get into top grad school. I guess the, I think there are a lot of things that are important, but I personally think that your personal statement and letter of recommendations are the most important ones. Personal statement is uh, something where, is somewhere where you can actually write a lot about uh, who you are as a person, what you want to do in graduate school, the kind of research you want to do. And you do, you also do need a lot of, uh, I don't know how it works now, but in my time, asking for a letter of recommendation was kind of one of the trickiest business in KAIS. <laughs> um, it's something that I, I had a lot of issues with just because um well i think people in korea decided that they, they might just want to write you two or three letters while some people while some people usually just want to apply to 10 schools so you might eventually end up applying asking for 10 different professors for that so uh this is something that you need to carefully plan out as well uh maybe be sure to ask the professors that you know well that might be willing to write um 10 letters i know those are rare but yeah those are something that you need to keep in mind uh gre was important up until i think the pandemic and a lot of schools had eliminated that requirement i believe i'm not sure if this will continue or is, if this is just something COVID that a lot of schools are doing. But uh, for a lot of, a lot, I do know that a lot of people are taking the momentum and they're like tr trying to uh, ask schools to eliminate the GRE requirements. And GPA is important, I guess, but not necessarily is very important. I think what they care more about is your research experience, the kind of things that you will write in your personal statement. And I've definitely heard a lot of people that will uh, justify their bad GPA in their personal statement by saying things like, um, I don't know, how they were very involved in their research and everything else. Um, so I think those are like what you really need for a grad school application. So it, yeah, in my personal opinion, the first two are the very important ones. Uh, the last two, I don't know. I don't think GR is all that important. I believe it's just a, a very crappy business model where that is designed to get to extract a lot of money from people that isn't really useful to evaluate people's uh, personal skills anyway, whether or not they fit to grad school. Uh, and GPA, I don't know. A lot of school even eliminated the, I don't know, they don't, they even allow people to have this as a new option, which is pass or not pass option the past year due to COVID. So I don't think they will rely a lot on GPA anymore too, at least uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, school choice. Um, well, mostly you gotta find a school that is that aligns well with your research interests, I guess. If you're interested in certain fields like um, biology, you got to find a school that has a very robust uh, program in biology that had a lot of probably math school and a lot of things that combine with that. So you know that there's a lot of collaboration going on, that kind of thing. What do you want to study more? 
like if you want to specialize in your current field and what do you want to do in the future because uh, some of us are like uh, I'm doing chemical engineering now and I want to do chemical engineering after I graduate just because that's what I do <laughs> uh, but some people are like oh I think I want to do uh, chemical engineering now but I know after I graduate, I don't want to do that anymore. So it really depends on people. Um, so yeah, maybe take some time before you're applying for grad school just to think of what you really want to do after you graduate, uh, after what is your PhD for? Just take some time, think about it. Uh, research choice. Um, I'm gonna speak based on how things work in the US and mostly uh, in my school. So the first semester is usually the time for people to meet many professors and decide. I was very lucky actually because I'm a chemical engineer. I was a chemical engineer. I applied for a material science program because I was very interested in a lot of electronics materials. Um, so, but I was also afraid to go to uh, a school that wouldn't have a combined chemical engineering material science program. So I was lucky that I got into a program that has the same department for both. So basically, they, I have a combined option of chemical engineer, engineering professors and material science professors. And when I talk to people, I realize I probably don't really want to do electronics because I talk to literally maybe 20 to 30 people in my first year. I, I was trying to figure out which of these guys will be the best guy to actually guide me to throughout my PhD, which, which of this research is something I want to do for the rest of my life, no, or, or at least for the next five years of my life. And I, I actually, I ended up go, choosing a field that is actually more chemistry related than material science, and that was fine too. And actually, my professor he was the academic advisors of several professors here in Kai, professor in Kais too. So that was an interesting kind of connection too. Um, yeah, so you may really end up doing things that was totally different than your initial plan. So just always keep an open mind. I think that's all I have, I think. And yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation and tips. I could totally relate to like the letter of rec recommendation part. Also, like that was also like really eye opening, like about you changing your research interest during your first semester, or, like first year in your mm -hmm. PhD. Okay. Now we have uh, we are go we are moving on to the second speaker. We have Mr. Youssef. Medad, who also received his bachelor's degree at KAIS in 2017. He double majored in civil engineering and industrial and system engineering. He pursued his master's in computer science and transportation science at MIT. And now he is a PhD candidate in transportation science uh, in MIT. So for our second speaker, the stage is yours. All right. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Very clear. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, thanks for the introduction. So um, I I graduated from KAIST in 2017, and I came to the U.S. for graduate school. I did uh, two years of master's, and now uh, in my final year of PhD. And I'll try and um, summarize step by step uh, what I think is important uh, for you to set yourself up. Uh, uh, into getting accepted to graduate school in the U.S. So I have not applied to graduate school uh, in other countries. So this is only for the U.S. Uh, so this is my background, which you, uh, which you heard from Naura. Um, so first of all, you need to decide um, if you want to go to graduate school. There are many alternative careers um, as a graduate of uh, KAIST. You can go into industry. Um, 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 I think in last session you heard about uh, careers in software engineering. So 
you really need to decide if graduate school uh, is something you want to do because it's a very big commitment. This is maybe five years, at least five years. Uh, sometimes uh, PhDs end up taking um, longer. And during those five years, you may not um, as earn as much money uh, as you would doing something else. But really, um, you should think about whether this is something that you want to dedicate in sort of a significant portion of your um of your youth i should say you know your uh your prime years you want to dedicate that to graduate school or not so uh once you've decided that you want to uh, do graduate school uh it's never too early to start preparing so if you're in freshman year you're probably very lucky because you can uh, start now and what you want to do in your graduate school application is to demonstrate two things the first thing is that um, you have a fundamental knowledge of the basics. So for example, uh, if you're going into a quantitative field uh, that you maybe know the basics of the field, that you maybe have taken some classes. Uh, uh, so, so maybe let me talk about a concrete example. Let's say, let's say you want to do machine learning uh, and vision. Well, I mean, uh, in your transcript, you should have maybe classes in, uh, in like statistics and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in like statistical learning. Uh, what else uh, is necessary for machine learning? Um, you get the idea. So that's the first thing, competence, right? And then the second thing is you want to demonstrate that you're self-driven and that you can uh, take a project, a research project from start to completion. Basically, you want to show that you can be a successful researcher and the only way uh, that you can show uh, or that you can demonstrate or convince the committee, uh, the admission committee, um, that you can do research is by doing research in your undergrad. So uh, at KAIST, I remember there's a program, I don't know if it's still, uh, uh, if it's still there, um, URP or, uh, or something like that um, on the graduate research project. So I applied for a URP in my second year at KAIST and it didn't get accepted, but I still did the research, right? So, I mean, I didn't get paid, but I still did the research because I liked the, uh, I liked the topic. And then the second year I applied for, a, for, a, for another URP and it didn't get accepted, but I did the research uh, anyway. So, uh, find any opportunity to join a lab in the summer, paid or unpaid, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, look at opportunities to, to get to know professors. So for example, take, um, uh, take classes with professors um, that do like research in an area that you like. And then maybe if you do very well in their class, you can maybe approach them and say, you know, I'm very interested in this research area. I've done well in your class. And I'm thinking about doing, uh, you know, like graduate school and research, uh, and then maybe have um, have an idea uh, that you want to work with them. And, and many times you'll be uh, they'll be happy to work with you. You could also do uh, an independent study. So there is a, I think it's a credit class. It's a four credit class that you can do in the summer uh, with professors. And so, uh, and then you should try and approach multiple professors because you're gonna need letters of recommendation. Uh, and the more letters of recommendation you have, the more people that are able to uh, speak and vouch for you uh, or for your ability as a researcher, the better for your, uh, for your application, right? Um, another thing is if you can be a TA or demonstrate any kind of teaching experience. So at MIT, um, uh, at KAIST, if you do um, if you do very well, let's say uh, on your freshman calculus or um, uh, or in chemistry or in biology, you are then able to uh, to basically teach those classes or tutor those classes to uh, to freshmen uh, of the coming year. And so, I think you should consider that very seriously because also part of being a PhD student uh, is teaching. And so if you can demonstrate early on that you that you can do that, that would be uh, that would be good. So so there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, and so the earlier you start thinking about grad school uh, and the more time you have, the better. 
So um, choosing programs, well, the best people to ask are, um, are people who are going to write your recommendations because they have been to graduate school. Uh, and I think many of them have been to graduate school in the United States. And so they not only know which programs are good, but they may actually have inside connections and they may know, for example, um, if a professor is accepting students, uh, still accepting students, maybe some professors uh, go on sabbaticals, some professors don't have a lot of funding uh, some years. And so they can, uh, they, can, um, they can tell you which programs to apply to. And also you do your own research. And, uh, and I write here, find your own niche. So when you're looking for labs for graduate school, don't, for example, write machine learning labs. There's like thousands of machine learning labs. You have to find a particular area that you're very interested in and that you've uh, worked on before in your research. So maybe um, just, to, uh, just to carry on the example I had, machine learning and vision. For me, it was machine learning and transportation. But so you find a very specific area uh, that you're interested in, and then you specialize, right? Because this is really what PhD is about. You, you sort of find a specific area and, and you essentially become, uh, or you basically push the limits of human knowledge uh, in that area. And I write here also that you should apply for multiple programs. So everything I've talked about in step one is maximizing your chances um, of getting into a PhD program. So think about this as maybe um, as like a binomial process. So you want to maximize P. So you want to maximize your success probability, but you also want to have many trials. So, so like you want to make N big. Um, N is basically the number of uh, programs you apply to. So uh, typically you should apply for two dream schools. So basically schools that you've been thinking about uh, since high school or, or uh, I don't know, middle school. And then three to four uh, reach programs. So maybe like programs that you think you're very likely to, uh, to get admitted to, and then some safe choices. So, uh, and then uh, how do you pick exactly dream, reach, and, uh, and safe? I think you should ask, uh, um, you should ask your recommenders. Uh, but I should say that you should not apply for a program that you know you're not going to attend. So for example, don't apply to a school in the middle of nowhere just because it's safe and you know it's not uh, uh, that you're not gonna uh, that you're not gonna attend the program even if you get accepted. So um, also also applications are expensive. Typically there is an application fee uh, in the U.S. at least I think around hundred dollars. Uh, there are fees uh, associated with sending sending let's say your TOEFL or GRE scores to those schools. So. Um, to try and be selective. But then again, the more, the more programs you apply to, the more options you have. All right, so um, spend time on your application. So um, you should apply in this, or, or, or like you should sort of like start working directly on your application uh, in the summer of your third year at KAIST, because um, in the fall of your third year at KAIST, uh, so basically, the the full semester of the uh, of your fourth um, of your fourth year, um, basically, that's the um, that's the application season, and then the next year, um, the spring of the following year, which is your final year at Kaist, uh, is the year where you get decisions uh, on your applications, and then you matriculate in the fall of that year. And so you should start working directly on your application in the summer of your third year. I mean, obviously you should have spent the previous three years, you know, doing research, trying things, uh, being active. Yeah, well, I guess one thing I didn't mention is that in addition to uh, being, uh, or I should say, in addition to demonstrating competency as a researcher, and in addition to maybe showing that you can teach, one more thing is that you should try and show um, some kind of like level of like university service. So, uh, because basically academia uh, is built on this idea of service. So uh, like as a PhD student, 
uh, you serve as a teaching assistant, uh, as faculty, maybe some of you um, uh, will become faculty in the future. Um, you do many things for university. So you like you sit on committees, um, you review papers, even as a PhD student. And so you should demonstrate that you have done uh, some kind of university service. So maybe join an organization like KISA, maybe help, uh, uh, help other students, that kind of thing, right? So show some level of community involvement that you're not siloed alone in your room. Not good. Um, so spend time on your application. So as I said, you should start working directly on your application uh, in, the, uh, in the summer of your third year. You should ask your professors for recommendations. And this can be a little bit tricky, but um, I think you should ask professors or maybe try and work with professors who have studied in the US. I mean, uh, maybe this is not the, it's not the best thing to say, but um, because they have gone through the exact same process that you're going through, they have, I mean, they must have uh, asked their professors for recommendation letters and they know that when you apply to the US, you should apply for multiple schools. And so, and so I think that helps a little bit uh, for there to be an understanding of, uh, of what you're going through. Uh, you should work on your statement of purpose. So basically everything on your, um, on your application um, doesn't speak for itself, I guess. I mean, for example, like a GPA is just, you know, uh, a couple of numbers, um, your research papers, I guess they, they sort of speak for themselves, but the statement of purpose should tie everything together. So uh, it should tell a story. So um, why are you passionate about that field? So basically it should tie your uh, past, present and future. So it should start by saying, well, um, I've always been passionate about this, this, that, and then I came to KAIST and I did this research. And then maybe you talk about uh, the different directions that research took you. And then you talk about your future and why graduate school is right for your future. Um, and in your statement of purpose, as Clara said, you should take that chance to try and explain away any, uh, any anomalies that you have in your transcript. So, uh, so uh, maybe you had a bad semester, uh, maybe you fell ill, maybe you didn't like a particular subject. Um, so, and speaking of transcripts, so GPA, you know, a lot of people ask, is GPA important or not? So I will say this, having a good GPA or like, um, having a good GPA is neither necessary nor sufficient to getting graduate school. So necessary, I mean, uh, it is not necessary, uh, to get into graduate school, which means that, um, a lot of people with not so good GPAs have gotten into graduate school. Uh, and not sufficient, uh, this means that if you have a perfect GPA, this is not a guarantee that you'll get into graduate school. You have to demonstrate that you've done research. So um, I think the problematic aspects with a lower GPA, well, I, um, or like I should say this, a low GPA is only problematic if it demonstrates like a pattern. So maybe if it's like a, it's like a one-off, that's okay. But if there's a pattern of low grades, if there is a pattern of maybe low grades and fundamental subjects that you need for your research, I think that could start being a problem. And also speaking of transcripts and GPAs, uh, at KAIST, if you, if you get, I think, a GPA of above 4.0, you could apply to become an honor student. Uh, and what that allows you is it allows you to take graduate classes at KAIST. And this is a very good chance uh, to basically set yourself apart when you're applying to grad school is taking graduate classes as an undergrad. So you should look into doing that. And also, um, if you take a graduate class for some professor, uh, they are very likely to write you a letter of recommendation. So this is, I, I mean, this happened. I mean, this is in my experience because I did that. And then finally, the GRE is, uh, uh, the importance of the GRE is, uh, is less and less significant. I mean, it's um, it's really a terrible requirement. I think to me, it measures nothing. It just measures, in a sense, how desperate you are uh, to get to graduate school, how uh, uh, how much time you're willing to just study useless things. But anyways, I'm, I'm, I am glad it's starting to go away. So 
So at MIT, it depends on departments, but I think computer science, they don't require the GRE anymore, but you should check. Okay, and finally, after you apply, so the deadline is typically December uh, of that year, uh, decisions come out the following year and sometimes uh, you will be asked uh, to, uh, uh, to be interviewed uh, by your lab. So I was asked, I was invited for interview two times or three times uh, out of the uh, 10 schools that I applied to. And then finally, you're expected to make a decision by April 14. I think this is the standard date for, uh, for schools in the US. All right, thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. So I'd like to highlight some tips. There, there were many tips though. So first do research about the prospective programs and make sure you do know what you wanna do. And then have some options aside from your dream op uh, options for your grad school. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Yosef. So participants, I hope you already took some notes by now. If you haven't, we have one last speaker and also Q and a session. Okay, let's move on to our last speaker. We have Mr. Perman Jorayev, who double major in CBE and chemistry, and also received uh, his bachelor's degree in 2017. He is now a PhD candidate in chemical engineering and biotechnology, University of Cambridge. He has done many internships. Some of them include internship in EPFL, MIT, and DTU. So without further ado, Mr. Perman, you may start the presentation. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the kind introduction and invitation. Um, I'm guessing you can see my screen? Yes. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, you mentioned already, but I'll talk a little bit about myself because I thought that could be relevant in a sense that just to see the profile and I guess some of them helped me um, get into the program. So yeah, I did a uh, double major in CBE and chemistry. Um, and in my last year, I messed around a lot and took some classes like microeconomics and accounting and stuff. And I, I think I, I read more sort of stuff about business and investing and finance in general in my fourth year than I did about chemistry or chemeng because I had some free time and, you know, try stuff. Um, so some of the things I did was I joined, like Yusuf mentioned, I joined early um, to a lab. And I think that's quite important. This is my my first year, I, I tried, I joined a lab in my first year. So um, I worked at, uh, I worked in two labs at KAIST. Um, we started off with like an organic synthesis guy and we looked at, so it's a paper that we published. It's basically synthesis, it's like detection of nerve agents um, with a goal to start with like Alzheimer's disease and all that, but it rolled into a different project. And then a different project I did is about CO2 capture with amines and it's porous materials. And it's actually with, I think this work was done like, I don't know what, three years ago, even more than that. But recently published it with actually a, a, a guy at Kais. Now I think he's in the audience as well, Intazar. He's an undergraduate student. So I did that. Um, I did sort of this like a bioscience. So we did looked into proteins that were related to cancer. And like we tried to find a way to target those like unique proteins and see what happens. So if you can image them because you can see what's happening during, you know, uh, cell division and stuff. So we looked at some of these proteins here. I'm not going into detail and bore you with that. Um, and then it was cool to develop grading with Sergio Ramco at MIT. So we looked into sort of ways to, you know, uh, more efficient way to uh, so improve the cracking process in crude oil. And I stuff this more for this, this picture is not mine, by the way, uh, it's from some random source to Stanford. And it was about developing some pathways for like economically viable way to get CO2, um, to get used for materials out of CO2 and water, because technically when you think about it, CO2, water and sunlight, it's just, it's, you know, if you can make stuff out of it, that's beautiful. So we sort of looked into it. Um, we can chat about it for a long time, but that's uh, what's the point. Um, so it's just that the, there were some questions about like what I'm doing and how that could relate. So I'll talk a little bit about it and I'll focus more on the grad school stuff in the next slide. A slide after that. So I think when we look, look at life, it's usually we can sort of look at it as like objective function most of the time because we try to optimize stuff based on the you know parameters that we have that could be anything that we care about and we have different coefficients for them, right? So career, money, health, and family would assign different weights and different coefficients. So 
And at the end of the day, it's how you define your function for yourself. At the end of the day, that's how you sort of evaluate your life. And you can sort of zoom in and do that as like individual day as well. So your performance depends on stuff that you do. It's a function of that. You know? And then people have different parameters, different coefficients for this. So for some people, you know, coffee doesn't matter. For some people, it matters a lot of different coefficients. So, um, so when you look at different things in life, I think in general, you could, you could define that as a function of like parameters and then look at the way to optimize output. So if you look at, say, solar panel efficiency, you know, we want to optimize the performance of it, then you could actually look at like how the manufacturing process goes, what are the costs of composition, you know, and then you could try to tune that in um, to optimize the basically the based on the output. So when you look at a drug, um, it's basically a uh, function of so many things, um, you know, basic chemistry, A plus B plus C goes to B. And then there are so many things that you add on top of it, you know, the time, temperature, like cooking, right? basically. So, and it actually takes 13 years and it almost costs like one point three or eight, I forgot, um, something like that to, for a drug to make it from like a design stage to the market. Obviously there's a lot of politics and like paperwork involved in it and clinical trials take a lot of time, but one of the difficulties is basically to quantify the impact of these parameters. So, um, for example, when you look at a simple reaction and look at like the parameters involved in that, you could actually get like potentially 50 million reactions to try, but obviously we don't do that. We have scientific knowledge and we say, okay, if I heat it up to like this temperature for this long, or if I add this material, it's going to work. So it's a complex problem because it's difficult to understand often. So potential solutions is basically, you know, we, we start with the target, specific molecules, specific performance, specific amount that we want, specific purity, and then you go back and see what happened so far. You look at the literature, you look at book and this Fabrino transformation. And so this is where the data comes in. So we look at like lots of literature data and then crunch through relevant information. And you, you take that um, and then because when the data size increases, it's difficult to solve that was like difficult to see as a human sort of quantify that. And then you could sort of look at, all right, is there a way that, you know, some of these machine learning models that could actually find me the pattern that could actually find me the pathway. And then you integrate that data with some ML models, some optimization models. And then the next question is, okay, I have this direction I'm going to. And then often we know we try different things. How long does it take for someone to be a good cook? You know, they try so many times to changing little variations. So to do that, it becomes really boring often because imagine running hundred reactions where you're actually modifying some things but you're not changing the entire thing. So this is why where the hardware automation sort of comes in handy because you could actually sort of fill things up, fill up your balls, fill up your reagent and everything and say, okay, I tell you, I tell this model all the reagents, where they are, what they do. And I have this model that's going to tell me how much of that to add and how to do. And then you just leave it there and you potentially, you could actually run hundreds of reactions without you actually doing it. So that's the beauty of it. And it's basically speeds up things dramatically. So I'll not go into the detail. It's just a surface level introduction of what I'm doing, but there were just like questions about it. That's why I brought it up. But the main topic was about um, grad school. So I'll, uh, we'll focus on that, right? Um, some of the factors, I mean, Yusuf mentioned, Clara mentioned really good stuff. Um, and to me, this, this is the way I see it. So letter of recommendation matters a lot because I've seen the cases where you know, your professor, the professor you worked with knows someone else at a different school and, you know, they serve as like um, um, sort of the, uh, what's the insurance, right? They're like a parent. They say, okay, you know, you can take this student, um, you know, um, he or she will be all right. Um, so that matters a lot. I've seen that work out and it's because, you know, grades and all that, people look at it and it's like, yeah, but if I know someone that actually knows that can tell, all right, this is good, this person is good, then yeah, Fox on that. So publication, if you have it, I think it's a great thing. And research experience publication, there's sort of come hand in handy, uh, sort of hand in hand, because you sort of, you wanna, you will be doing that. And the best way to demonstrate is basically by doing it. You know, you don't wanna like claim and say like, give me an opportunity and I'll show you how great a researcher I am. Like you show it and then basically people take you. Um, SLP, this is, um, I think it's quite important. I think the problem that I see often, I've seen different SOPs in different areas and I, I was asked to give feedback. And when I see that, I made the same mistake myself. We sort of try to put all that jargon and all that information in. It's like, show us, show ourselves that we are the best. But it's really sort of knowing the way to write it 
write an email, write, an, write a letter, an essay. It's just, it's really beautiful. There's sort of a way to do it. And if you write me a good SOP and if I read it, that's clear to a point the person sort of has an idea about what he or she wants to do. That's really satisfying. In the, in the like two page of jargon where I'm like jumping around and trying to understand this random person, I'll probably not read it. So I think it's really, it's really important um, to, to be able to write it in a certain way. And GPA is important. The reason I put it in green is sort of because GPA is often used as like a cutoff limit. So um, it's important, it's useful. Obviously having a higher GPA will definitely benefit. Um, but it's not really the number one factor. So I personally didn't focus too much on the GPA because just honestly, laziness, didn't want to do most of them, uh, classes or homework. So I didn't do it. And I'll sort of say it publicly, I said it many times before. I think my GPA when I applied was like 3.6 something. That was my GPA when I applied, but I had a confidence in my, in what I've done and like the, you know, the person I knew and people I knew in terms of like, stuff I have delivered and stuff I could show and write. Um, TOEFL is important because you sort of want to make sure that you can read and write and sort of speak. And GRE, I mean, talked about it, pretty useless. Um, so yeah, I think GPA is like, I, I think I passed the cutoff limit. I got offers from the US and UK. So um, so I think that that's it, yeah. Um, but obviously try to aim for higher than, like above or try to aim for that, like honestly. Um, it's, it, it will help you a lot, it will benefit you a lot. Personally, I didn't do it. And I think here we're like really quickly opposite, uh, opposites with yourself, for example. He was a, I think he was a great uh, person. Uh, it's sort of like to learn from in terms of studying and uh, taking notes, attending lectures. And he did it the right way. I think I personally didn't do it. Messed around a lot, um, didn't care too much about GPA. But if I'm asked to go back and say like, all right, do you want to, if, if you go back, we're going to give A plus in all of the classes, I'll say no, it's like, because what's the point? I won't do it, but it will help you. Like, so try to do that scholarship, something that people asked. Um, the way I see it is for PhD and master's obviously is different, but I think, especially in science and engineering, um, US and Asian, like American Asian schools give good scholarship. Uh, not good is subjective, obviously, so it's pay is the best, but, um, US and Asia are pretty good. I think they tend to give to most of the students. EU is all right. They do give um, scholarship. UK is the worst, even though I'm there, it worked out for me. But I know a lot of people that are on government scholarship and I know a lot of people that are, not a lot, but some people, some people that are basically paying for their PhD. So it worked out for me. I'm working with a pharma company. I'm, I got a scholarship from the department and all that. So. It worked out. And honestly, Cambridge was the only school I applied in the UK and Europe. So um, I, I did apply um, to the US as well, but I, Cambridge was more sort of aligned better with, my, with what I wanted to do. I think stuff to look into, um, this is often like sort of reversed or like when we look at things, we want to sort of like, oh, we want to go with the brand. Obviously brand is important. The fancy name is important for the department and school. And but supervisor, I think, matters a lot because um, I messed around a lot. I did many different projects and my supervisor was absolutely cool with it. And then it's also usually the supervisor that sort of teaches you and guides you through, you know, difficulties and all that. Um, to give you an example, I, my, my, my PI couldn't care less about how many hours I work or like when I work. Doesn't really matter as long as I get stuff done. So this is, it's good. So it's not like a micromanagement. One thing to know is like, look at the alumni of that lab or the professor, because that's like a clear signal. Uh, publication is okay, but if you look at the alumni and they're all at like this miserable places, then you're like, yeah, what are they doing? You know, what's the point? Um, sort of want to look at the, if you see the alumni doing really cool stuff at really cool places, be it in academia or industry, I think it's a good sign that prof takes care of his or her students. So that's, I think, important thing that people tend to neglect. Field is important, I think, because you sort of try to plan things looking ahead rather than looking backwards. Um, to me, I'm doing stuff at the interface of like um, chemistry. So there's a lot of science involved and there's engineering, the hardware part and reactors and there's some coding part. Um, I, 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 it's something I wanted to do, which is really usually a lie because people don't really know what they want to do. They try things and you find out. 
Um, yeah, country, a lot of people will aim for the US um, for fair reasons, um, because, you know, people want to move, leave there. And yeah, it's, it's a fair system. Um, it's just that didn't really, I personally didn't want to do lectures of two years. Um, you know, I couldn't, again, uh, undergrad problems. Um, so I didn't want to do lectures. I just wanted to work on a project. And I also didn't really, I was not aiming to do a PhD. You know, I thought, oh, I want to do a PhD. I wanted to do it, but didn't want to put up with the lectures for two years to do that. So that's the reason I didn't do it. Um, another thing is that you probably want to contact the PI. Um, most of the schools will say, don't do it uh, before the application, but I don't agree with it again. Um, but again, something that you sort of mentioned is that when you write an email or, or, a, or a SOP, just make it specific. Don't, don't fill it up with the jargon. Just say, like, I'm super excited. I'm dying to join your lab and do this. And it's, it's BS. Just like keep it simple, to the point, know your stuff. Like read some papers about the professor, read some papers about, like do your homework. Because we usually go the other way around. It's like, oh, give me an opportunity. I'll show you how great a person I am. It's not like you need to do your work and then you sort of wait for things to work out. So if you write that well, and um, I did contact some of the professors in advance. Um, I think some of the websites will say, uh, ask you not to do it. Um, I will say do it um, because most of the websites are I think way too generic information. It's just for general population and it's not specific. And I've seen so many exceptions that I don't personally buy anything that's on the website. I mean, obviously some of them are true, like you need SOP, you need Teufel and all that, yes. But um, I think contacting a professor and saying clearly like, all right, I'm interested in this field, I've done this, I'm, I'm gonna do that. That could help. Um, PhD or no PhD, I think this is the most important question to look into because it's a lot of commitment. Um, uh, yeah, I think with most of the time people sort of go into a PhD that maybe they don't really have any other option. They haven't really explored because they don't know many people that have done it, that have done other things. So they are like, all right, let me try out PhD, but don't try it out. It's like explore it and then decide if you want to do it or not. I had some clear reasons that I wanted to do it. Um, that's why I did it, um, especially with the CS, I think the question was about. I have made friends that started working right after undergraduate, and I have friends that are doing PhD, and you could sort of, it's really personal, it's really up to you as a person and how you work and how you operate. Um, so talk with the right person. I think when you think about KAIST alumni, there's one Lai, and he's at University of Illinois Urbana in Bain. He's, uh, he's done interns at Google and Adobe, and um, he's doing a PhD as well, he did master's at Purdue. So I think he's the right person to talk to, to see both sides of the things. And then when you talk with people, I think try to hear both the goods and bads, um, because we're always biased and we try to sort of uh, reassure that we made the right decisions and we just talk good stuff. But uh, try to see all the sort of the trade of that you are sort of getting yourself into, all the problems that you're getting yourself into, so that sort of you're aware of it. Just know that certain linear regression is something that we humans tend to do because we want to simplify things, we want to understand things, and it annoys us when we don't. When we don't, so we try to sort of boil these complex things down and say, like, oh, it's a linear regression. If I have one publication, I will get into this school. If I have this GP, I'll get into this school. I will see in real different cases. Um, to give an example, one of my friends at MIT, one of the smartest, hardworking, and the most skilled person I've ever met, he um, he got rejected from so many schools. Uh, he's, he's, he's American, by the way. <laughs> a lot of schools in the US, he got into MIT. Uh, I know other people that had like several publications, didn't get into like most of the schools. So the reason for that is often your application won't even get evaluated. When the department gets like thousands of publications, so I don't think it goes through all of them in detail and you'll just get an automated rejection email. If you get it, some of them just, just ignore. Um, so it's not a linear regression. Don't try to make it like, don't try to be a genius and say, all right, you know, if I do this, this will happen, then you'll be depressed. It's like, what's the point? You try things out, like you sort of distribute it across different spaces, because that's like the way to sort of optimize your way, diversify it basically. And different roads could work out. Um, like I said, I think we have really opposite sort of personalities towards education and the way to learn with Yusuf, for example, but I think we both are doing okay. So I think it can work out. Um, everyone is smart until it's too late. It's sort of something I made it up myself. Um, try stuff out early. Like don't start thinking in the, in the last year. I've seen that a lot. Um, even like with some of the people I told them when they were freshmen, I said like, yo, 
try this. You know, you could do things like do this exchange, do this intern, join the lab, try this, try that. And then it's like two or three years pass. And it's like, all right, oh, I want to do something. You know, I thought about this. And you're like, what? Like, we talked about it two years ago. You haven't started yet. Well, like, what are you doing? So try stuff out early. That's the best way to find what you're doing and what you want to do. And um, most of the time when we're like, when we tell people like, oh, how easy it is. You know, so I've done this, I've done that. I knew I wanted to do this. That's usually not true. We're all usually in a chaos trying to figure out ways. And then when we do that, we sort of tell people like, oh yeah, I've done it. I knew that I was going to do this. Like, not really, not really, no. Um, most of the time it doesn't really work that way. So you try stuff out and then that's how you find if you like it or not. And other stuff, um, lots of stuff. Um, yeah, if you have questions, I think these are the ones I thought I could summarize in a page so people can look into it. And because Clara and yourself really sort of went in detail and explained about these parameters. But I thought I would sort of share information that's usually sort of personal information that I, the data I have with myself and with my friends. Um, so yeah, that's that's all from me. Um, oh, that was all right. And um, yeah, please let us know if you have any questions. Um, okay, I guess. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Berman. So sure. probably two things to highlight from your presentation for everyone, pay attention to the aforementioned like factors and also like try out stuff, be outside your comfort zone, I guess. So I think that concludes the first part of the session today. I'd like to thank all the speakers for giving a lot of useful information through the presentation. Now we have the Q&A session. Ali will lead the session. Ali, you can start. Yeah, okay. First of all, thank you to the speakers, Berman, Yusuf, and Clara for your invaluable words. And uh, uh, a word before we move on to the Q&A session. Uh, uh, these talks are being recorded, so if anyone missed out or came late, uh, uh, the Zoom meeting is being recorded. It will be posted on the Kai Headquarters group and the Kisa YouTube channel. I will post the links in the chat. All right. So, and the speakers, I, uh, I hope you're ready for the questioning and sure, yeah, go ahead. Go good ahead. luck. <laughs> so let's just, um, I will basically elaborate on the questions uh, in order. So the first question is how many recommendations usually do the universities ask for? Is three enough? Yeah, they probably don't even care about the third one. So just as long as it's neutral and positive, really try to get a strong one and put it first because no one has got time to read the detail, um, all of that in detail personally. I don't think I see. it's professors when they have like, like hundreds of emails a day, especially if they're like, you know, at top places. They have grants, million dollar funding that's mm -hmm. pending, the papers that's pending. And I don't think they care too much about reading that in detail. Maybe I'm wrong, but you know, please correct me yourself and Clara if I'm uh, biasing my way out here. <laughs> but that's how I know it. Um, yeah, I think that assessment is fairly accurate. I would say, so So, for example, some programs have a minimum uh, number of recommendation letters. I think, I think MIT has three, if I can remember, but, but they allow you to submit up to five. So um, I will say, so letters of recommendations you know, they won't hurt, you know, as long as, uh, you know, uh, as Berman said, they're, you know, like either strong or neutral. So don't ask, don't ask someone to like begrudgingly write you a letter of recommendation. If you feel that they're not interested, just, just forget about it, find someone else. And uh, so it's important to have one or two good letters and maybe five mediocre letters. Um, and so uh, and so early on, as I said, you should find a uh, one, two, or three professors, and you should work with them, do research projects, and uh, have them vouch for you uh, for your application. I think I agree. You need three letters. Sometimes you will have to ask for a lot of professor for that three letters for a lot of different schools the way things work in Korea, but you do need three and make sure you at least have one or two strong letters. The third one is okay. All right, thank you. 
Um, so the next question was basically regarding the regions. What are the best regions in terms of funding for a master's degree? How is it different from the order that you presented like US, Asia, and then European Union, and then the UK? Uh, from, wait, it was that for me? I mean, the, I mean, the master's degree. Yeah, master's degree. Yeah, I think I've seen that um, the schools in Asia, like Korea and Hong Kong, um, tend to give scholarship to masters. Um, so obviously, Yosef uh, knows about the masters as he's done it on the funding. So there are some departments and some schools that it might work out for masters in the US, but they often don't tend to give it. And I mean, there's a way out of it, which is not really super ethical, but you can apply for a PhD and master your way out. And, but, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anyone to do it, but they, yeah, but so I think, yeah, it's, it's really department specific, country specific. So you really want to sort of just explore the websites really, because I've seen master's scholarship for some of the departments in Cambridge and depending on your citizenship or the major that you're studying. Um, but yeah, you just want to do the website homework really. All right, thanks. There was actually a relevant question to that from Yusuf, actually. Uh, the question was that, I guess that master's is not required in top schools like MIT. Uh, what is What this means is that, can we go straight for PhD? And can you please elaborate on these two options? Yeah, so, uh, so the typical path is actually to go, uh, uh, is to do a PhD straight uh, from your undergrad. Um, so um, uh, maybe I can talk a little bit about the, the like the previous question. So, so um, as Brian said, um, it depends on funding, but I think there's sort of like an easy way to tell if there's funding for this master's or not. And that is, uh, does the master involve research or not? Because there are many, uh, many different types of masters. Some of them are simply uh, just coursework. So maybe you go to, uh, you go to a university and you take some advanced classes, there is no thesis component. And in that case, I think uh, maybe unless there is department funding, uh, there won't be funding uh, for you, um, meaning you would have to pay to attend. But if the master's has a thesis component, meaning you have to do research to graduate, then some professors just think of you as, uh, as you know, like another PhD student. And this is what happened with, uh, uh, in my case, because uh, you had to have a thesis uh, for you to graduate. And so um, it's really just a case by case basis, a program by program basis. Uh, but if you can apply for a PhD directly, that is fine. Um, the reason I applied for, uh, for master's really versus uh, just applying for directly for a PhD, at least with, uh, um, with respect to MIT is that uh, I really, uh, wasn't sure that I was ready to commit five years. Uh, and there was an option of uh, master's at MIT with funding, so I took it. Um, at other schools, uh, they didn't have master's for funding, so I applied directly for a PhD. So. But then again, when you apply as an undergrad to, uh, to a PhD, you'll be evaluated based on your own merits. So you don't need to worry about having a master's. And I think the majority of people uh, that, have, that have known at MIT uh, got admitted straight from undergrad. So you don't yeah. need to have a master's. And Probably I think your thesis matters a lot if you go straight for PhD then. It does. And I think if you do a master's, I think maybe the bar may be a little bit higher because, so basically if you do a master's first and then try to come to MIT, I think the bar will be a little bit higher because you're now evaluated as a, as a master's student versus as an undergraduate student. So they expect you to do, uh, to have done a lot more. It also gets a bit different because um, because of the duration of the PhD and the structure, you often get the master's on your way to getting a PhD in the US. So they want people from bachelor's. You also, it's also one way that I've seen the master's being a disadvantage for some people because they want like fresh minds so that they can train them in a certain way to learn and think because you come with this like predetermined mindset of doing a research. And then I've seen different sort of disagreements between students and professors because student wants to do it a certain way because that's how he or she has seen it. And then the prof is like, no, I don't want it this way. Um, so it can often be a problem and you're also like 
your evaluation point goes up. So sort of the, you're in a different league to get evaluated. All right, thanks. So maybe moving on to the next question. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions actually. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, we can I, speed things up, go for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So maybe I can skip over a few questions. Sorry guys, we're just short on time. So there's a question like, I have the following questions. How do you feel after the several years of PhD? What did you like the most and what was stressful? Miserable. Um, <laughs> obviously, obviously joking. Um, it's really a personal question again. Depends on how well your PhD is going because if it's working, you're like on the top of the mountain, you're like, you're killing it. You're the most smartest person. But then you have a couple of months where nothing works and everything fails and trying to figure your way out and it's sort of part of the process. And I think that's one of the reasons that PhDs are valued in industry as well because like you can't quit, you're sort of stuck because it is a trade-off that you already committed two or three years and you question like, do I, do I need to get out or do I suffer a bit more and get stuff done? Um, so you really, that's why you sort of learn how to run like a big project on your, on your own in the long run. So you try to, you learn to build things up from scratch. Like you don't know where you're going, but you need to find a way to go, a place to go. And also you need to find a way to get there. So you need to learn what you need to learn. You need to learn what you want to do. So it's a complicated thing, but personally, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I mean, nothing has changed, but it's just doing the work. Um, but again, uh, mental health issues are a big thing in grad school with a lot of people that I've known. Um, so just be realistic. I think it depends on how you manage it because if you're sort of a professional and you commute to like, I want to be in the lab or office from 8 a.m. to 9, to 8 to 9, like at 8 or 9 and then do my eight hours a day and you really do it well, I think, I think it's fine. But often you sort of treat yourself like a student, but then you're doing a really difficult job that requires a lot of commitment. And then there's no one sort of checking you every day, like demanding, and it's sort of like you mess around a little bit in an uncertain, chaotic area. Um, so it's really a personal question, but personally, I think I'm, I think I'm all right. Um, Yosef, Clara. Uh, I actually have a question for... Um... Uh, I actually have a question for Perman. Uh, so I actually saw your internship with DTU, MIT, EPFL, and you, I have to say you have a really decorated like undergrad. So I'm really intrigued on how you like um, manage to get those internships. Um, um, did you like ask a professor or did you use links uh, with the professor you were already working with in an undergrad? Or did you like uh, contact professors directly there? Um, so I'm Sure, uh, we could get into that, but I think the previous question is really important, like how you feel after a few years in PhD, and I think we really want to hear a feedback from Clara and Yosef, and 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 see like what they think about it, because again, we're different people who want to do completely different things. I think um, so. It really matters. I think their opinion matters a lot here. We really want to listen. No, Clara, do you want to go first, or um, you can go first? Just... Okay, so I would say. Um, um, being a PhD student is very different from being an undergraduate student or even doing research as an undergrad because uh, as an undergrad, when you take a class or we do a project, uh, oftentimes the answer is there or is at least within reach. But for a PhD, uh, you're trying something that no one has done before and you're trying to expand the limits of human knowledge. Um, and so you need to be well, number one, you need to work independently and you need to be tenacious. There has to be a certain ruthlessness to you, meaning you just keep keep trying, uh, not give up. And, you know, sometimes it's hard, you know, uh, on certain days you get good results and you feel good. Or other days I think you've been trying for a very long time and pinning your hopes on just suddenly it doesn't work or you find a research paper from 1995 that did the same thing. So... So your novel idea is gone. Um, so I think um, um, I think it has its ups and its downs. I think throughout your PhD, you should just have this mindset that uh, you'll be all right uh, if you finish your PhD or uh, if you drop out. So you, I think you're going to do just fine. Um, 
you yeah. just graduated from KAIST and you're a very smart and valuable individual and finishing your PhD or doing the progress in research does not really define you as a person. So I think just as long as you have this mindset is that you're going to be okay. I think, I think it should be fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than that it also helps to have, to have a good support network. So uh, this could be uh, other graduate students, or it could be your family, it could be your advisor, it could be your significant other. So uh, yeah, that's my take on uh, on this question. Um, well, for me, um, I'll start off by quoting what you have said, um, everything's gonna be fine if you have the mindset that said it's gonna be fine. And I do remember before I left for Korea in which that I met several professors from KAIS to ask what they think about going to the same school that they went to actually. Um, and he said, you're from KAIS, if you're from KAIS, you're gonna be fine. And <laughs> I like to say that that's probably not true, but it did give you some sort of self-confidence to go through. <laughs> Um, at times I feel like, oh, this is so hard, but then I remember, oh, what that professor did say, you're from Kais, you're going to be fine. <laughs> um, but PhD is hard. Um, a lot of my friends, they suffered a lot of mental health issues. I think they did a survey uh, recently in my department and 60% of the students had been going to a counseling of some sort. And it's it's not just a lot of work pressure, but also like the feeling that will this ever gonna end? Uh, feeling like, I don't know, a lot of people like did say that a lot of people that they talk to, like their family members, significant others probably don't relate to their experiences. And that's one of the hardest things actually, because you have your support system, but they don't really exactly relate to what you're feeling or what you're exactly having, deadlines, feelings that you can't graduate ever. Um, so I personally have enjoyed my experience, but I don't want to like gloss over it. <laughs> I've enjoyed my experience. Uh, there are good days, there are bad days, good research result and bad result. You found a paper from 1995, like you have said. <laughs> where people have done certain things that you're planning to do. So it's tough, but I think learn to, uh, I don't know, enjoy it with the mindset that you're going to be fine. And I think you'll be fine. Yeah. I think, yeah, like Claudia said, the main point is like you're alone. Like no one relates to it. To try to talk with your family, friends, they have absolutely no idea what you're going through. It's like in a rabbit hole. And, but I think it depends a lot on how you structure it. So you feel like, yeah, I want to do academia, I love it. Then it's, 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 sort of, it's a nice training ground that you're learning to do stuff. So if you look at it that way, I think it's enjoyable. But then if you sort of look at it as like an industry, like I want to learn some hardcore skills to do stuff, to do a big project on my own and carry this throughout a few years, then it's a great thing as well. That's, how, that's what you're supposed to do. So it's really up to like how you define it. If you said like oh, I'm a miserable PhD student still, and I'm like, and you treat yourself like you know sleeping around and like in a in a in a yeah, half asleep, half awake, like just going through life, then yeah, it it, it sucks. But if you, if you really sort of structure it as like an important thing that you're doing, like pushing the boundary of human knowledge, then yeah, it is important, and you sort of feel valuable, and you try to do important stuff. In that sense, yeah, often it becomes something more enjoyable. All right, thank you for your answers, guys. So uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, did any of you take a year or semester off? My master's degree ends in summer and most US universities have only fall applications for the PhD. So I might not make it on time with visa. My resume might, look, might not look good or impressive before graduation. So what's your take on this? Did any of you guys take a year or semester off? No, I did not. My advice would be not to sort of like wait around and not do anything, maybe join a lab, uh, do some research, do some work, get some publication done uh, and not just take time off because, I mean, you know, like take time off if you need to, but uh, if you're taking time off just because uh, of the mismatch in dates, I think you should 
um, um, I think you should do research during that uh, time period. I also didn't, didn't take a year off or a semester off, but same advice, uh, get something done, do internship, go for a lab or something. Right. So yeah, the, the next question is more specific to the funding. Uh, it's asked to Yusuf actually, have you applied to only MS or the integrated MS and PhD programs? If the former one, in what circumstances do universities give funding for DMS? So, yeah, so so this is similar. Uh, so it really depends on the program. So uh, the program I applied to at MIT, they had funding uh, separately for MS, uh, or you could have you know, applied to the PhD program directly. Some universities, um, they don't offer funding for, uh, for masters and some universities don't even offer a standalone master. Uh, instead, they, um, they have sort of like a master's of, uh, master's of engineering, not master's of science. So it's more coursework and, uh, and less research. So I would say it's, uh, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. All right. So do any of the other guys have any take on this, Berman, Clara? I mean, it's really specific. You need to do your work and explore the universities and departments, especially the fields that you want to do. Yeah, there's no short answer, but like I get messages on LinkedIn and stuff sometimes. Like, I want to do a PhD, what should I do? And I'm like, don't do anything. I mean, what do you mean? Like you, you should have done some research on the website and then come with me with a specific question, you know? So it's just difficult. Like specific questions for yourself makes sense because like, you know, he's done it. But if you're saying like, what are all the master's programs that give me funding? It's like, yeah, just call a customer center. They might be able to help. Like, you know, <laughs> just, uh, just, just try to be, <laughs> um, yeah, let's just try to be specific, I think, because that's a useful information, but it's very really generic and we're not benefiting anyone here. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a question regarding whether ranking matters. Uh, uh, for example, you're pursuing masters in a, like, lower ranked university. So, and you want to apply for PhD in USA. So uh, whether it's worthy or not, can you give me your opinions regarding the matter? Well, I would say, oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. I, was, I was just gonna say that maybe like publications are the great equalizer. So uh, if you have uh, good publications, if you do good research, I think it doesn't matter uh, much really where you did your masters. So if so, basically, as long as you're doing good quality work, uh, I don't think it matters much. Yeah, work matters a lot. So with this, yes, you can sort of pull up some projects on your own, but with other science and engineering departments as well, if you are doing your work during a master's as a research and you really do something cool, you basically email the professors that usually find one or two professors that are doing, that are working in the similar field and they know the area. And if you tell them that, yo, you published this paper with these problems, we've done similar work and I've done this and that, then you are a trained student to that, that can start working. So try to find a professor that you actually, you can match. So if you just email the university and the department, they was like, yeah, we encourage you to apply to this department. We have this application period, blah, blah, blah. But if you really do good work, like you have really good something to show for it, like your rank, ranking matters. But like you said, if you show a good quality publication or work and you show that to the professor and say, we've done it, you know? And that's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take you because you're trained. I don't need to spend a year trying to train you and you, for you to mess around to learn. You can start working as soon as you come here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so try to do work, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, the, the next question was by Taha. Uh, he asked you, uh, like Berman, uh, he asked you that you had a very decorated profile for your undergrad, and how oh, did you he, how did you get the internships and labs with professors and all? Oh, because it diff, it's difficult for some students to do so. Yeah, um, so the I guess the workflow sort of happened as in my first year I was like, yeah, you know, we're going to do undergrad, take some classes. Yeah, millions of people have done it. It's like, yeah, sure. So is there anything that we could do? I was like, yeah, I think I can join the lab. So I thought about it and I joined the lab. And then I thought, yeah, I'm actually using, you know, learning quite well at Christ, using the facilities, learning from these great people, really smart people, but I could also learn different cultures and different work environments. So 
in my second year, at the beginning of my second year, actually, I was like, I started looking for internships and it's just literally like some, even some of them are like really bad scam pages of like internships. It's like, I was literally Googling that and I found some, it's like, I applied. So a story that I think I, when I had a quarter count, I wrote about it, but when I, so the EPFL one was one of the most competitive. It's like out of thousand students around the world. So there's no like a requirement in terms of that can like minimize the number. So thousand people, the GPA requirement was like three, seven, five out of four. And then you need to be in like top 5% of the department and all that stuff. I didn't meet the criteria in some of them. And I was actually, I had just finished my two semesters and I was starting my third semester. And I emailed the head of the program and I said, yo, I'm actually this student. I've done some stuff in high school that I, I know some science and I'm taking some classes. I would like to apply, I might qualify. And then the lady said, um, it's super competitive. I'm afraid you will not get in. And then I was like, all right, is there a way out? So I tried to convince her, even though I, don't, I didn't have to. And then she said, like, just go apply. So I did. Um, I wrote about sort of say, yeah, by the time I get to the internship, yeah, I'll have done this. And I basically, I'm doing this now. And I'm, you know, I, mean, I can run some projects on my own. And they asked for two letter recommendations. I submitted three, because yeah, why not? Um, and it worked out. I was actually the youngest in terms of number of semesters because they selected most of the people from third and fourth year. And I have no idea why they selected me, like honestly. So that's what I meant by linear regression. It's not really linear regression. You can't say, I'm qualified, I will get in, or I'm not qualified, I won't get in. And especially in terms of that's free. It's just, it's just a matter of your time. Like you try things out. And I, and I emailed, I applied and they accepted. It was a well-paid two months pro program and then they paid a lot because of Switzerland, I enjoyed it. Learned some stuff about like biology, biosciences in general, and it was a lot of fun. And often there's sort of this actuation energy or a threshold in life that once you sort of get over that, you can sort of open more doors. And one thing leads to the other, if you could try it, you know, you get punched in the face a few times, but it's all right, you try one and then don't tell anyone if you failed, because that's why we, that's why we're afraid of failure, I think. Yeah, just feel free. Um, yeah. So yeah, I got rejected from quite a many internships. So I don't even remember the names now, but yeah, back then it hurt. It's like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not useful to anyone, you know? Like, yeah, I think that answer might reassure many of the participants here. Same so, with PhD, yeah. same with PhD, yeah. same with internships, same with the grades. We like, we don't want to tell that we failed. Cause like, you know, it's like, we tried to tell her like, yeah, you know, everything worked out. It's been great, you know, I'm killing it, but it's not. They try stuff out. As long as you win like more than you lose, you're still on the positive side, so why not? And then one thing led to other, and then from there on, it's just about talking with professors, emailing universities, emailing professors, and trying to find my way. And that was it, honestly. But yeah, I was working during the semester time as well, just then FYI in the lab. So I had something to show for it. It isn't just like saying like, oh, please accept me, I'm gonna kill it. No, it's like, I showed you, <laughs> I've done this work, you know, I think I can do this one, could we work together? Oh, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Try yeah, stuff out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, the next question, which I think is a great one. Um, you guys talked about joining or exploring the labs or research areas. So the question is basically, uh, what plays a greater role, like exploring many different areas of research and doing that or just pursuing one thing and doing it for a longer period of time? What works better? Um, I'll go ahead with this one, I guess. I, I had a kind of like not linear route to uh, when I was in undergrad, uh, mostly because I guess I was uh, not adjusting well when I was in Kais, like with how Korean labs work. And that sort of played into how I ended up choosing a lot of different labs during my undergrad. Like um, there were times you'll have things in the lab where their behavior, like the attitudes of the people in the lab for international students weren't as nice as you would have helped them to be. And that was one of the driving factor for me to choose different labs and things didn't work out well too. And I personally have tried three different labs in Kais. And if it were due to, I mean, if I could have chosen, I would have chosen like one same lab where I could, where I was passionate about and do things continuously, but I couldn't do that. And so I had to change lab 
and change a different lab. And actually that also gave me a lot of exposure of the kind of thing I wanted to do and give you more room to talk about what you know and what you want to do. So I think that's good in a way that's like looking for the, I, I don't know, um, do your own thing. If things had worked out for you, like in one lab, and if there's no problem, I would advise you to continue. But if things don't work out, like if people don't want to speak English to you, or if people were just rude, or they think you're undergrad, you don't do anything, you just have to go to lab meetings, and that also wouldn't work out well. You want to go into a lab where they'll let you get hands on, have your own project, and more often than not, unfortunately, and at least in CBE, it wasn't the case. So, uh, I, some people did say that choose younger professors, they have more confidence in undergrads and international students because they just got out of, get, got out of their PhD. So they had more experience, especially those people who did their uh, PhD abroad. So they had like, uh, exposure to um, international students environment where there are collaboration all over. And I think that's the best advice I could, get, I could give. Um, just to comment on that, as given that you just mentioned it. Um, so you want to look at the website and see how many international they have where they had. But if I was a young professor, um, young professor, I think I beg to disagree because you will work really hard if the professor is young, because the professor has a skin in the game, they need to prove something. And most of them don't get their full professorship. So it's a really tough journey. And then some of them drag you along. Again, it's super personal question. It really depends on the person. I've seen such an amazing young professors, but I've seen that most of the professors, but then the trade-off is that if they're young, they sort of need, tend to train you really well. I've seen some young professors that go into the lab to show you how to do things. Like my professor like doesn't even tell me, you know, what I'm going to do with my life. It's just like, yeah, what are you doing? It's like, what have you done? Show me. And what you want to do? It's like, I need to show everything. So forget about like, how I, do I know how to use this? Do I know? How, no, it's just like, you need to figure your way out. So, but then they tend to be laid back because they're not afraid. They don't have a proof. They, they don't need to prove like with 20 or 50 publications a year that they deserve a professorship. So it's, it's a trade-off, but I personally would prefer more mature, more established professors because they tend to be laid back and they sort of tend to have more control if things go out. They sort of need, tend to find a way. And the field, I think it's personal. I have some friends that are, they just love one thing and they just keep doing it. Personally, I can't do that. I, I, I'll i probably drop out. I can't do one thing for a long time. Yeah, I struggle with that. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing an interdisciplinary research. It's just like jumping around doing different things. It's exhausting because you need to use the same mind for like different things. And but it's also sort of what keeps me going, I think. And again, people have a different take on that. Some people love, they know what they want to do and then they just keep doing it and they love it. So beautiful, yeah. Okay, I hope that answers the question, whoever asked it. I think it was Nabila, yeah. So, I mean, uh, I hope you guys are okay with the time and all because there's still, I mean, a lot of questions we can go as long as you guys want. But um, if you guys feel like uh, it's taking too much time, just let us know. So yeah, the next question, it's uh, related to academia. Like, I'll just uh, read out the entire question. So you guys did go to grad school after BS or MS, didn't you? Is there any people you know that go to PhD after some time, like sometime after finishing academia, maybe even after finishing industry jobs or something? What did they say? Is it more difficult to get in or is it the same or what? Um, so I have a friend in my lab who basically did two years of uh of industry experience and then they applied to the PhD program and I think it uh, it depends on the type of uh, on the type of research that uh, that you want to do I mean if it's an applied field uh, sometimes having industry experience gives you an edge um, so I would say um, if you plan to go down that route um, well one important thing is to stay in touch 
uh, with your undergraduate professors because you're going to need them to write you a letter of recommendation later and to develop a good relationship with, uh, I don't know, whoever your manager is in industry so that they too can write and speak to your, uh, uh, to your abilities. And then you also have to, I mean, I should say this. In a certain sense, you can do whatever you want, but uh, it should, I mean, uh, it should sort of like type, um, you should be able to explain it in your statement of purpose. So maybe like try and uh, explain why did doing maybe like one or two years of industry was maybe uh, necessary or beneficial uh, to, uh, 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 to the lab that you're applying to, what kind of industry, um, what kind of experience uh, you bring um, and how does that tie into one another? So, for, so like for example, you need to explain why that you're now doing uh, industry that you then want to go back into academia. So maybe there is something that you've discovered that is not as efficient as possible that you mm, maybe want to improve upon. Um, maybe working in industry like intrigues you somehow uh, and now you want to do uh, and now you want to devote yourself full-time to research. So that's the way I would go about doing it. I also know people who've done industry and come back, they went back to school and for a lot of reasons, they probably want to uh, get better paying job at some point. They probably want to study more about some technology that they believe could be useful and so forth. All right, thank you for your answers, guys. Um, so, yeah, there's a question by EC. It's a really long question. Plus, I think there are three questions combined into one. So, EC, if you can maybe speak out your question, like phrase it up a bit. If you're still here, EC. And then unmute themselves and talk. Uh, are they allowed to unmute themselves? If they can't, the person might be shouting, but... <laughs> Just read out the main point, I guess. Well, uh, it says that... Uh, Yusuf said that research is a good thing to write about in your statement of purpose when applying for a PhD. So would research also be useful in SOE for, SOP for masters, considering masters programs are only one, two years and contain minimum research? It's a really subjective question, but it's yeah, kind of phrased for use of. Would, I mean, would research be useful for masters? I think it depends what kind of masters. Is it like a coursework masters or is it a thesis-based masters? I think if it's a coursework masters, I mean, I imagine maybe the focus would be more on your GPA, but uh, if it's a research-based master's, then yes, it will be useful uh, if you've done research before. All right, so the same guy asked, should I consider applying and transferring to US or UK during my undergrad to have more experience with the professors that know the system and more contacts, et cetera? Sign up for a personal session, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have like state-of-the-art Kind of research in Kais too. You don't really have to. Yeah, yeah I mean, you have really great professors. Sorry, Claire. Yeah, yeah. All across I the think region. so too. Yeah. It's sort of a common thing around Kais that's like, yeah, it's exams, so it's stressful it's so much. Yeah, it is most of the time and most of the places. Is is you have a lot of facilities. You know, the amazing library that was built. Lots of things are being promoted at the time we left. And imagine like we were still okay four years before that. You know, it's like. Things were great and things are even better now. So we often, like, I shouldn't be the one saying this who went to different places, but it's actually like there are a lot of things, good stuff that you can do. I did them during the semester time, but it wasn't just like, I don't want to do anything at KAIST. And want to, no, it's actually great. Have, funding is great at KAIST. You can actually spend a lot of money trying stuff out and breaking things. That's Yeah, great. exactly. Especially for <laughs> masters, I've heard. Yeah. I'm a graduate, things are extremely fast as well. You order something, it gets the next day. It takes 10 days, two weeks, and you work for the US in some places. You have an idea of writing that in the next day. There are so many good things, but there's this general, like, sort of over of like, sort of complaining about things that you already have. Yeah. Um, I did it. Um, but 
not much. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's a great place. Do stop it, guys. Like, try to get yeah, stuff it's a general impression, I think. Yeah. yeah. Try to get stuff on so that you can show it. So, there's a question like, should I have all background knowledge to do research during my undergraduate? For example, I haven't taken some courses in my undergrad and I want to do research. So is this like recommended or not? Well, I think you should be familiar with the basics, for example, um, you know, um, well, I think the first thing is that you should be willing to learn uh, and just be uh, eager and passionate uh, about the field or area that you're doing research in. And I think you could, you know, catch up pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, maybe wait until you've taken, you know, like at least one class on that, uh, on the area that you're going to be doing research in, or maybe like, you know, just the fundamentals. Uh, yeah. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. Just add on to that. Lots of things don't really depend on the course. I mean, like you don't need to wait for a course to learn something. Uh, it's actually sort of an annoying way that things have taught because like, I'm going to teach you this chapter, but don't read the next chapter until next week. It's like, why? <laughs> Like if I'm learning something and if I'm in the mood of learning it, I really want to find out and have it finished. Because like, to me, things were a bit annoying because you sort of learn a part of it and then it sort of feels like you ate the appetizer and were taken away from the main dish. It's like, especially if you want to do research in that area, just grab a book, just read, just read some papers, watch some lectures and get an idea about like, otherwise you really don't know if you want to do it. You're just like, you're seeing your rights. Like, oh, I want to do machine learning. It's like, I want to do, you know, this, but then I want to do like electronics. So then... Have you done anything about it? Like, have you done some research, read about it? Like, you know, took some lectures, read some books, some papers for a weekend or two? Come on, if you don't put in that hours and then you tell a professor, like, I don't really know anything about it, but I want to do it. And it's like, yeah, sure. I have like a thousand other people that want to do it as well, but they have done their work, you know? So yeah, I mean, don't wait for the class, just read it. Of course, and yeah. You're holding your back, right? <laughs> just grab it and read it. So if the other speakers don't have uh, any other opinions on this, uh, we can move on to the next question maybe. Um, so uh, it says that maybe, can you guys uh, elaborate on how you guys proceeded to get an internship in esteemed universities? Like, can you elaborate more on what you guys did specifically for those universities? Um. You mean how to get an internship? Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, it's, it's usually general, right? There are like three or four factors that actually affect an outcome of publication, be it for a job, be it for grad school, be it for internship. So try to find out what they want. Do they want like someone who can do some stuff? Then yeah, try to show that you did it. You know, you did a similar work. You have, you also have some good grades so that you're not really, you know, complete, like you can actually, you can commit. So GP actually shows that you can commit. You can show up, you can learn and you can do so that like research experience, some letters, obviously a uh, statement of purpose that you, you, you write when you apply for an internship, your GPA, it's the same process. You want to show that you can do a research and then try and then apply to like, I don't know, 10 places or 15 places or two, if you think you, you can you know, get in. So you apply. I think that's uh, in short. I don't know if I answered the question, but to me, yeah, it's a generic workflow. So, Yusa, you have any opinions on this, Clara? Uh, no, I agree with Berman. I didn't really apply to internships specifically when I was an undergrad. Um, well, um, I did internships at labs, and um, I just simply uh, wrote an email to the professor, and uh, it's typically uh, it was typically professors that I've taken a class with, and you know, they know me, so. Um, but I think in general, I think uh, as far as general advice is concerned, I think what Perman said makes a lot of sense. I agree. I didn't do internship either when I was in Kai's, except like for different schools, only in Kai's lab. And some lab really pays you well. All right, nice. Uh, so we're only left with a handful of questions, uh, don't worry. So um, let's see, let me choose the next one. Uh, so, 
So yeah, I think uh, I'll choose a more general one, uh, which may apply to more students. So there's a question, do the grades of your first, first year courses matter more or do the grades of your next courses matter more when you're applying to grad school for undergrads? Maybe your major courses grades matter more, I think. The higher but level you definitely courses? Don't wanna, you definitely don't wanna be showing a D for your calculus, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I think it, you don't want to just show like just the pattern. So like in my head, as long as there's not a pattern of like, you know, um, that, for example, that you're not uh, maybe serious enough about uh, uh, about your freshman year. But uh, if it's, you know, one or two classes that are that are, uh, that are really irrelevant to you. So, for example, me, uh, I didn't do uh, I did not do too well on chemistry lab. I mean, you know, I don't know, just whatever I touch that seems to break or catch on fire but <laughs> I mean I got uh, <laughs> I mean uh, so, it's a lot of money to Christ by the way <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so my grade was not too uh, was not too good on that subject so you know and you know I don't you know I haven't taken any chemistry with the class after it was uh, I was traumatized but uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah, so basically, as long as it's not relevant, and then the weight is more towards the courses you take uh, towards the end. All right. But then also remember that you will send your uh, transcript uh, at the uh, at the beginning of your fourth year, right? And so mm. the GPA for your second and third year should be should be pretty solid. Yeah. 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 So yeah, let's just take the last question now. Um, it says, uh, uh, it's from a prospective student actually, he's not yet in KAIST. So he says Good. that I have admits from other universities ranked in top 100, including Europe. Could you give any idea how I should choose a college if KAIST shall be worth it as my first priority or not? Europe probably doesn't give a scholarship, I tell you that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it's, yeah, true, yeah. Person doesn't really have a scholarship once yet, um, unless like he or she is European. Uh, or like a perspective place. Um, yeah, really difficult question. I mean, Kais is one of the one of the best places, but then you also sign up to so like 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 a Navy SEAL training camp or something because you went through really you go through like really tough sort of challenges because it's, it's it's not an easy place. It's not like everyone walking by can come in. You know, it's like yeah. it's you get selected. So it's like you're supposed to commit to something. You're supposed to show, and that relates back to the question as well that. If you're good at one thing, but you're miserable at so many other things in your first year, you know, if you have like three classes that are like, I don't know, C plus and like stuff like that or four, um, especially for like a science or engineering student, like you don't want to do that. You know, if you're smart enough getting the case, like just put in some more effort and try to make it better. And um, so that question as well, if you want to work, it depends on like what culture you like as well. Um, some people love Asian culture and they want to go there um some people want to stay in europe so it is quite a lot of personal question depends on your again cultural things and um what you want to do and all that so yeah i think you want ping people um, but yeah all right so yeah thanks for the answer if anyone has uh, anyone else has any other opinions on this um, no, I just want to say that Geist is a great place. It has a lot of opportunities and it will, um, I mean, it is a very difficult place sometimes because, yeah. you know, uh, of how high the bar is, you know, uh, and also how good everyone is. But I think you can, you, you can come out of Geist, you know, like the top in your field or, you know, very, very, um, um, someone with a lot of potential. So. Just make the use, uh, make the most of what you have. That's basically yeah. a theme, I think. That, word, um, word. Yeah, I think you're not going to see a big difference in the lab or like book. You're still going to be reading the same book in Europe and the Korea. Still going to use the same thing. <laughs> it gives the same result, you know. So it boils down to more like a personal question. So do you like the food there? Do you like the people? Do you like the culture, the weather? Um, and also what do you want to do after graduation? Do you want to get a job? Do you want to go to academia? You know, it's... It's such a specific question. The field as well, it depends on the field. Uh, but All right, so 
Yeah, thank you guys for your answers. And as far as the chat goes, that's, that was the last question. Uh, and if anyone wants to speak up. Uh, I actually have one last question. Uh, during our first like I talk session, there we had speakers from CS usually. And they said that uh, the more you pursue like academia, the more you do like MS and PhD, um, the less chances you, the, you reduce your chances of getting into industry later. Like, what do you like say on that? Um, yeah, it depends on the field. Um, it, it, it sort of decreases your chance because you become overqualified at most of the jobs because they don't want to sort of hire you. They, they don't want to pay you more with a PhD to do like basic things, like, you know, bring me coffee, do this paperwork, do that. You don't want to do that. So you want sort of a specific things. That's why you sort of become overqualified and overtrained to do like some things and you sort of narrow down your uh, a thing. But if, so what matters, I think, is the transferable skill. Again, when I showed the optimization thing for like life and then data performance to like material. So if you sort of have the skill that you learn during your PhD and you can take it, and then applying to different problems, I don't think you are limited. Um, but yeah, it does make you overqualified. And you also question like, yeah, I put in this many hours, this, this many years, and you know, do I really want to do this job? Um, so in a sense, yes. But again, it's specific to the field, the country, the university that, that you are doing your PhD in. Yeah, and I think like certain, um, certain jobs, um, actually do require a PhD. So for example, even in companies like Google, they have, they have a research arm and they do you know, cutting edge research. Uh, so yeah, so definitely you could work in industry. So, so. Just super specific, like I think most of the questions, find a person that has done something similar that you want to do or like, you know, find that person, drop an email, contact them. It's okay if they don't reply, you know, that's the worst thing that can happen. Try and find and try to tell the negative thing, try to hear the negative things. Try to see like what's the trade-off, uh, what the trade-off is. And yeah, goods and bads. Try to learn it from that right person because other things are like visual, again, it's not linear regression and there are so many exceptions. Yeah, okay, I think uh, that's it. And uh, thank you guys for taking so much time out from our busy schedules and answering the questions uh, and such. Uh, Invaluable, piece of, invaluable pieces of advice. So yeah, uh, thank you uh, participants for attending the talks and thank you speakers for your time and your knowledge and wisdom. So yeah, uh, I guess we can end this here. Sure, thanks guys. Thanks everyone, bye bye.